some artists don't do any art when they, I'm commercial artists I'm talking about when they're not involved in a project. Now that's kind of a tipping point and that's an interesting thing to consider. And, and again, it's one of those honest assessments of do I do this just for the love of it for myself anymore? Or do I tend to do this more when I'm involved in a project? And different people have different answers. Um, I would argue, and this is just what I've seen, um, you know, in working with people that when that tipping point go towards kind of career burnout, it, a lot of people don't do it as a hobby anymore. They don't do it out of just love. They don't do it in their free time. Hello and welcome to the Art Department Podcast. We're at episode 28 and I think we have the most important episode yet coming up. Um, with me is again Emmanuel Shu in San Francisco. Uh, it's me here, Jan Oshul in Singapore. And we have a very special guest again today. And uh, I'll throw it to Emmanuel right away to introduce us to this guest. So this is Jody. Uh, and Jody is somebody I met at the orphanage many, many years ago. Uh, and I'll just say that um, he's one of the producers that I actually really remember. Uh, and I was telling my wife, uh, especially in, in one case when I was talking to him about my screen credit uh, and the way he handled that conversation with me. Uh, I, you know, I'll always remember because uh, not everybody handles it in uh, a, as delicate a way and as caring a way as he did. And so uh, even though we haven't really worked together since the orphanage, um, I've always remembered that conversation. But on a more serious note, um, the reason why I've really wanted to do this episode was the uh, the recent passing of uh, uh, Mike Nash. Uh, and I feel like um, it's something that I've always wanted to address, but it hit me a lot harder than I thought it would hit me. And I really want people to know a little bit more about what mental health is about. Uh, and we'll dive into that. Um, but that's why this episode is happening. And I really hope that this is something that will help people. And I know uh, it, Jody definitely is going to be great for <laughs> sharing with us. Um, so Jody's going to tell you a little bit about himself. Uh, he has a really interesting background uh, that everybody should listen to. Um, so without further ado, is Jody. Thanks. Thanks, Emmanuel. I, I, I have, uh, now that you mentioned that conversation, I, I do have a vague recollection of that um, many years ago. Yeah, you're very, yes. very, very right. Um, well, I am, uh, I am now a clinical psychologist, um, training to be a union analyst, uh, but I was in the film industry uh, for about 20 years prior to this. Um, it became the career that I came out to LA to do uh, after film school and, and a lot of other different schools that I went to um, because LA back in the early 90s is where you came uh, to do film. And I started off working on sets, um, kind of as a PA and then a production coordinator, production manager. And then I got into commercial editorial for a while, um, basically being an assistant editor and then kind of maintaining the technology on the early Avids back in the 90s. And then I, I really wanted to get into feature films. That was really my love. And... I wanted to get into the visual effects end of feature films because what appealed to me, and I, it, your, your paintings actually reflect, reflect a lot of this, Emmanuel, that, that I've seen you post on social media, is the idea of building worlds. That was always the appeal for me in films. It was the world building. It was being able to create something out of nothing. And so like most people of my generation, uh, I'm close to 50 now at this point, um, I grew up with Star Wars and Close Encounters of the Third Kind and the Spielberg Lucas era. And um, those were sort of my cinematic idols. I mean, that's the, those are the kind of films that I wanted to be a part of. And I was lucky enough to do that uh, throughout my career. And eventually I became a visual effects producer and worked on many, many films. And I ended my career 
uh, I wanted to go out with the bang, so I uh, got a job on Avatar uh, as one of the production side visual effects producers. And that uh, was my second to last job in the film industry. The, the very last one was helping to set up an animation company, um, basically here in LA from a company that was owned by, I think it was a Chinese billionaire who decided uh, that he was going to let his son get into the animation business. Um, and then after that, I enrolled in a doctoral program and changed my life and started a new career. Wow, that that is just, I mean, I it blew my mind when I actually knew that you were doing that. Because, I mean, that was a big career to go into. It's not how many years did that take for all the schooling and all that? Oh, wow. Well, the actual schooling took five years. The actual process of starting out, building a practice, like starting my own business, basically, and going into mm. business for myself, took about seven. And for about half a decade, and I tell this to people uh, when we when we talk about career switches, and I, I do have a fair amount of people I've worked with in the entertainment industry that, you know, ask me about career change, but I didn't earn a single dollar. Well, maybe here and there did some consulting for some companies, but I, I really didn't work for five years, so I wasn't earning any money for five years, and if you haven't lived in L.A., and, and paid the rents here and the cost of living, not earning money for five years was a tremendous shock to me. Um, mm. To be poor again at the age of 40 was, um, or close to 40, was, was a, just an immense shock. And I thought, oh, I made a mistake, and who am I kidding, and this, I'm never going to see any money mm. again, I'm going to be poor for the rest of my life, but that's not what happened. Um, but it was a, an incredible... Uh, eye-opening, life-changing experience for me. Wow, and, that's uh, quite a quite a leap. Um, <laughs> and it's safe to say that things are on track now, uh, obviously, after so many years. Very much so, yeah. Okay, that's yeah. awesome. I mean, that's for all, uh, all of you out there who are, you know, maybe not even thinking of taking such a big leap, uh, but, you know, we have people who are taking small leaps, you know, of trying different disciplines within <laughs> what we're doing. Like, mm -hmm. you, you know, you should be very encouraged that you can do it and you can do it at any age, at any time. Uh, and I would encourage you to really find that passion, I think, um, to do whatever you want to do. Um, so, uh, obviously, uh, we were talking about, you know, the mental health side of things and a lot of this uh i mean what happened to mike was a shock basically to everybody um and it's just one of those things where i feel like there's so much uh i don't even know how to call it like a mental uh health issues uh that people have i mean there's I mean, I didn't even know there was like anxiety and there's depression and then there's a lot of different things. Um, and I feel like, especially in the pandemic, I was, uh, I mean, I felt, I mean, I was down for a while, you know, mentally, uh, but I'm not a, I'm, I don't think I have any sort of depression, but, and I think that does it to a lot of people, but I wonder what that does to people who have issues uh, this, this whole pandemic and, and, and the isolation and all that kind of stuff is, is that something that, uh, you know, you have any thoughts on? For sure. I mean, I, I will say this, everybody at some point in their life is going to suffer from either depression or anxiety, every single human being, it's almost inescapable. And so, you know, it's not really, a disorder unless it gets to certain levels, but we're all going to feel sad. We're all going to feel uh, sort of depressed, lack of energy, low motivation. There's going to be some physical effects from that. It's it's fairly normal, actually, um, and it's normal whenever there's some big transition, whether it's wanted or not. Um, now that being said, the pandemic has, uh, and it's really a couple of things in the pandemic. It seems to be. A, a kind of slurry of isolation, uh, actual lack of, of kind of social and community interaction, um, 
a disruption of most people's lives, you know, and also the kind of things that are happening to people is that, you know, work and kind of personal life are collapsed. They become one thing. Mm. Um, for example, I work with a lot of couples and one, one of the things that many, many couples talk about are very practical concerns that have an impact on their mental health. For example, how do you determine when you're in a coupled relationship, a marriage, long-term relationship, like who gets what room, right? Mm -hmm. How do you stay out of public spaces when it's time for lunch and somebody else, the partner, one partner's on a Zoom call and the other one's trying to make a sandwich? You know, what? what is that normal separation that exists has been obliterated for many people. There are some people that I know who uh, drive into an office where there's nobody else there and they'll, they'll work in an office just so they can have that sense of separation, that sense of routine, that sense of normalcy. And for most of us, in, in most of our careers in visual effects, we would go to a place. Well, the going to a place, actually, it's like a transitioning through a door. You're actually entering a different psychological state, and we're cued to kind of do that automatically. And with the pandemic, for many people, that's been taken away. And so you have this collapse of the personal and the professional into like one space. That's just its own very kind of stress. The isolation is another kind of stress. Looking at uh, sort of two-dimensional monitors as a, or two-dimensional surfaces as a way of communicating isn't natural for us, right? Mm. So if both of you look around the environment you're in right now, you'll notice that as your eyes move, the saccades, as we say in psychology, you're basically adjusting the focal length of your eyes. The muscles are doing different things, right? You're actually doing what human beings are supposed to do, which is kind of scan your environment, look around. You have a sense of depth. Looking at a two-dimensional surface for interacting, I'm not talking about for the actual use of work. I mean, because you both are used to that, having spent many, many years in the trenches. But as a form of interaction, there is an unnaturalness about it. And it's mm. kind of like cutting off a, uh, a channel of communication. Like every time that we communicate with people, every, every technological advance, I should say, of communication means that we're removing one or more channels from it. Like right now, we have the channels of kind of tonality. You can hear my voice. You can hear as I talk slower or faster. You know, if I have some emotion in my voice, you can look at my face. But imagine if we turned off the cameras. Well, then it's just my voice. So you don't know if I'm smiling or frowning, right? Well, let's take away voice as, as we do with text. Well, there's no tonality. Did I mean that sarcastically? Did I mean that seriously? You can't tell. So we remove bandwidth. And I'm not talking about bandwidth in a technical uh, informational sense. I'm talking about it in how do we process sensory information. You know, depending on who you read, 80 to 95 percent of human communication is nonverbal, right? You're nodding slightly and, and Jan, you're looking kind of thoughtful over there, <laughs> yeah, right? So yeah. I'm and I'm taking that as cues to say, oh, is what I'm saying landing? Well, if we take all that away, it's like talking into the void. And that sort of upsets people. So if people, uh, you know, that upsets our psychology. And when that happens, People that are already predisposed, um, sorry, it's raining here really fiercely, so if you hear some noises, that's, that's kind of coming down pretty hard here in L.A. Um, but this, this idea that you, you both work in a very high-stress environment, right? And stress leads to an exacerbation of any kind, all kinds of psychological difficulties. Now, if somebody already has kind of a psychological difficulty they're already coping with, you throw stress on top of that, and then you throw isolation and this collapse of work and professional life, and personal life rather, into that, then you're more likely to see uh, psychological difficulties. You're more likely to see problems with what we traditionally call mental health. And it all comes out. It's not just one thing. It's the combination of multiple factors hitting a, a human being. And it hits us where we're most vulnerable. That's just what happens to human beings. Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine I mean, if, if somebody like me who, you know, I don't have a, a history of uh, any issues and I was already 
and, and it, it's interesting that you were talking about that uh, uh, all the sensory stuff. Uh, for me, it was I, I think I'm used to working at home, um, used to kind of having all that. But you know, but what was hitting me was just a, a general sense of of uh, seeing people in distress. Uh, and, and, and for me, it, I, I was like constantly looking at the numbers of the coronavirus deaths and everything every day. And I was, you know, like a lot of people do it. You know, I didn't know how, I didn't know how to stop. I was just like, Oh my God, look at that. And I took it on and I was just going completely like I was going down in terms of like, I was becoming a little bit depressed. Um, and, and I always wondered you know, for people who had depression, how did that even, and, and I know that, you know, for a lot of people who have depression, I think it's even worse and, and, and it, it may even cause more, um, uh, issues that, you know, we don't even know. I mean, I, I could only imagine, and I'm wondering if, if, um, have you, d does that, does it, does the, the, the people who have issues, how do they get help? I mean, is it, you know, like, or, or what can they do in those situations? Well, the great thing about this, this, uh, at least to be a therapist right now with all of this going on, is that most of us are able to provide telehealth services. So if somebody needs therapy, Almost every therapist in the United States right now does therapy over Zoom or some sort of uh, video conferencing option. I mean, I'm completely telehealth with my practice right now. Um, there are some people, for example, therapists who work with young children that, that will still see them in, in their office because it's kind of hard to keep you know a seven-year-old uh, attention mm -hmm. focus on Zoom. So they, they tend to come into the office. But there is so much help available out there. And most of my colleagues right now um, are kind of going through the same experience I am and that we're all very busy um, because everybody's stuck at home. Um, everybody's experiencing, you know, the uncertainty of when is this going to end? Am I vulnerable? Um, you know, you, you're both talking about a loss within the community, but I don't know anybody personally, and this is just in my sphere, uh, who hasn't uh, known somebody who's been impacted severely through COVID. You know, I, I personally have uh, I've known three people that have passed, um, and none of them were over the age of 45. And that's just astonishing to me because when this whole thing started, the you know the medical data uh, and the scientific literature I was reading saying, oh, well, this is going to predominantly affect people that are older or you know compromised or have some sort of underlying condition, uh, which is true. What I wasn't counting on is the people that are in their 30s and 40s being impacted, sometimes fatally. Um, mm, yes, yes. You know, and so the idea of of mortality and, and death is is confronting us all. You know, and yeah. even if you recover, there's there's side effects that, uh, and from what I can tell, are long lasting. At least with some patients and friends that I know. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's hard, um, and you know, I I remember uh, I, I used to see a, a, a um, I mean, a psychologist uh, or, I mean, I don't know, a therapist. I mean, I guess. Uh, because I was, I had you know, for myself, and then I had uh, for couples counseling. You know, this was many years ago, and I do remember one thing that uh, is difficult is to find the right um, therapist. Mm -hmm. uh, and and to me, I feel like if I was a, uh, you know, if I had it, you know, some sort of severe issues, and I wanted to get help, I wouldn't know who to talk to. I mean, I know there's a lot of people, but then is it? Is there a more a reliable way to find the right person? You think? I can tell you what what the majority of people who come to me as clients say, which is that a lot of it is word of mouth. Um, somebody will know a good therapist, who then knows a good therapist. 
uh, therapists are also really, really, I mean, the, the ones that I know are all really diligent and quite responsible about making sure there's a good fit. So if mm -hmm. somebody calls me up and says, hey, uh, do you know a good therapist for, you know, the, some issue that they'll say um, for this kind of uh we call it a population. So a person who's 35, you know, who's African American, who's having trouble dealing with, um, you know, COVID related issues and family conflict. Most of the therapists I know will really think and say, oh yeah, I do know somebody who's good with that I, or somebody who specializes in this. And so a lot of it's word of mouth. Um, there are plenty of therapist listings. You can go on psychology today and literally type in a zip code and then a bunch of therapists will come up. But I think the ultimate thing is, is remember that you're, you're not just paying. It's not like going to find a car mechanic, you know, you're not paying for somebody to just come in and do a tune up. It has to be a fit. And I believe very strongly in patients, like calling up a therapist, most of them will give a, you know, 15, 20 minute consult on the phone. You'll get an idea of kind of how their tone is, uh, sort of a, an intuition maybe if, if it's a fit, have that first session. If it's not a fit, every therapist is required to give you some referrals, you know? And all the therapists I know mm -hmm. who are, you know, by and large really ethical will say, you know what, I, we're probably not a good fit, but I can think of somebody who will be. So it's about really taking that plunge, you know? And and really knowing that you as, as the patient, as the client, you're the consumers. So if somebody doesn't work for you or feel good for you, that's okay. And most ethical therapists will say, you yeah, know, that's cool because it, it's not going to work. The, the, the therapy won't work if it's not a fit. You know, the relationship is a relationship. It's a professional oh, relationship, yeah, but it's, it, it's a real one. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember... I, I mean, I was also quite difficult back then, and I went through quite a few because I didn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was me, not them, because I didn't want to be there. So everybody had an issue that I was like, ah, oh, <laughs> that's no good. And, and, you know, at some point it was like, well, you've been through like six already. So, you know, um, maybe the problem's not with them. Yeah. But I, I guess... Um, you know, if you are, I mean, a, a lot of people are home alone, you know, now, especially in the pandemic. And at what point do you say to yourself, ah, you know, I, I think I have an issue? Because I think a lot of people who have issues don't realize they have issues. They mm. just kind of go into despair. And, you know, is there a way to sort of, because I, I don't know, um, but I can only imagine that there would be people who, are going deeper and deeper into a hole, which, you know, if they don't do something about could be a problem. I mean, is there a way to recognize that in yourself? Well, the ability to really have the, the question, do I have an issue is probably a good sign that it may be worth checking out. You know, you, you, the, in this age, you can go online and literally go down a depression checklist going, okay, am I experiencing lack of appetite? If am I experiencing sleeplessness? Is my mood changed? Am I mostly hopeless? Is there lots of suicidal ideation? You know, you can just go literally go down that checklist and they're, they're available for many sites. If, if, um, you're experiencing anxiety. Most people have a pretty good idea of when they're anxious because you feel it in your body. I had to go to, uh, you know, basically get a doctorate to learn that, you know, I, I paid money for this, that they're called feelings because you feel them in your body. They're not up here. <laughs> they're here. Right. And so when there's a lot of predominantly negative feelings, which means, you know, really deep anger, sadness, something that feels intractable, it doesn't go away. That might be a good sign. If you're experiencing physical symptoms that go along with those feelings, sleeplessness, uh, if you're experiencing changes in appetite, if you're thinking about suicide, feeling hopeless, that's a good kind of indicator right there. And I, and I use those because those tend to be the most typical. Right now, there are other kinds of issues that are sort of kind of below the surface and they don't come out unless there's a kind of stressful event. Well, guess what we're in the middle of There's a fairly exactly. stressful event. 
And so it naturally happens that when a human is exposed to something that's really uncomfortable and terribly stressful, that our psychological equilibrium is affected and some of those issues will come out. And another good source is when a partner notices or a friend, mm -hmm. right? Now, there's some people that don't listen to their friends, and don't listen to their partners. And say, ah, you're, you're, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah, man but, up, you know, whatever, yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's just, the, the, you know, toxic right there because there are things that we do not get through by ourselves. It's like saying, oh, I'm going to just, I'm going to man up for diabetes. Oh, this cancer, I, I can beat it. I'm going to man up. No. You know? It's, it's, and it's really, uh, you know, I think in this day and age, at least in California, most people I know, there's not that uh, sort of negative stigma of going to therapy, you know, because everybody at some point in their life that, that I've encountered thus far uh, either needs it or has gone through it. You know, it's not well, forever. Yeah, yeah it's, it's funny because I've actually, um, we were just talking about this, Jan and mm -hmm. I, right before. Um, and, uh, you know, personally, I have no issues. I think that everybody should talk to a therapist at some point because I actually, it helped me a lot in my, just finding myself. Um, and I, I, but I do still feel, I mean, in the U S there's still people who feel like, well, you know, going to a therapist, um, it's, you know, do I really need it? You know, is it really going to help? And and it's expensive, you know, and so they're, they've got all these built in excuses, but in Europe, right, Jan, you were saying, well, I don't, I don't want to talk for everyone, <laughs> but I feel like, uh, when, I mean, most of my knowledge, of course, comes from movies, right? Um, but it feels <laughs> like, um, in, in America, at least people are far more readily, um, going to, to, to therapy or uh, accepting the, the fact that they might need to go, but I feel like a lot in Europe and, and I'm from Germany and um, in, in various parts of Europe, of course, it's different. But I think there's still very much like what we just mentioned, like the whole thing about like um, man up, right? Like um, in only really going to see somebody if like your parents drag you there or your spouse drags you there or it's really like this close to a catastrophe. But I'm, I'm wondering if, if some of these issues that we've been talking about are especially um, prevalent in, in the artist community. I mean, it, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, go, uh, I don't want to deny the amount of diversity and everything that is, that, that is needed. And that is in, in the industry, there's plenty of, of great female, otherwise artists, but it is still a fact that I think a, a big, the demographic skews heavily male, um, in, in mm -hmm. this industry and with artists. And, um, I feel like there's, there's a lot of like, like tough it out like you have to you have to show you can pull like five all-nighters every week so uh, to keep up with everybody else and you have to crunch in a in a game studio and you have to work long hours in vfx and everything and and that it feels like oh if you if you're trying to if you feel like you you can't keep up anymore you fall behind and that if you tell other people that you you go see someone about the issues you're having that you you you're not competitive you can't make it kind of thing and mm -hmm. at, at the same time i mean I'm, I'm looking i've actually had a look through some of the um, like forums and um, um that talk about mental health and some of the more popular like uh, artists kind of like uh, forums and servers and and a lot of people i think are again struggling in the artist community with like imposter syndrome like stuff like lack of mm -hmm. self-esteem the the need for validation from especially other high profile artists the, the the need to be noticed like generally having like a very defeatist attitude when nothing works and you can't seem to uh, improve your art and everything has to be on a co constant upward trend kind of thing mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and i mean we, we all know that right it's like oh you have to grow a thick skin like okay if the art director doesn't like your artwork and he tells you it to your face uh, you you can't go in a corner and cry but you have to like tough it out and you have to take whatever abuse that and anybody else like uh, throws at you and i'm just wondering if you if you want to steer the conversation a bit more towards like really what what about artists and what about them and like maybe not everybody around the world is like 
<laughs> not not everybody around the world is like like v how, how to say like not everybody is very good at noticing like self-analysis noticing what's going on with themselves and if there's a need to to do something about it and i think especially when when people are at home when people are freelancers when people in all parts of the world um with artists especially like a lot of introverts right like a lot of people who just want to like put the headphones on and the hoodie up and just walk until late at night i mean um like w w I, d I don't even know if i have a question i'm just wondering like um short of short of seeing somebody maybe it's not as maybe there's a lot of like social stigma um associated with seeing somebody or it's not as easy to to talk to someone over zoom right um as it is in the states but like what what could who can who can people who have issues who can they talk to how can they even notice if they should talk to someone i mean that's like well, i mean that's kind of like what i just yeah yeah, yeah so i mean it's a, it's a, it's a big issue well well i mean i will i i can tell you what i've seen having been in the trenches mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know <laughs> some of these, well, these hold on one second there jody i i, I just to interpret what jan's yeah, yeah. saying um, <laughs> please be uh, there i i i because I, 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 well, I think he's also asking is there anything specific to the art um entertainment industry mm -hmm. uh you know anything specific to this that that you know you can advise or mm. or is there any you know for people who are artists um, is there a specific, you know, way of dealing with things that are maybe more suited for them or maybe something you've noticed? Um, oh, sure. you know, yeah, sorry. Sure. I, I mean, by and large, the industry, um, how should I say this? The industry is very stressful and depending on how long you've had a career in the industry, I don't think most people understand quite how stressful it is. Um, I certainly did until I got out of it. And it, and I, it, the one thing that I really, really love about what I do is I have met and worked with and gotten to know people very deeply from across very different walks of life, from finance and, and law, uh, tech, um, I mean, you, you name it, just, just other industries. And I will say that the entertainment industry uh, ranks up there with among the most stressful. And it's the most stressful for a lot of reasons. One is it because it is sort of, there is a v very real tendency towards kind of uh, abuse, abuse of artists. Um, it is very kind of age uh, discriminatory, not on purpose, but be, it's a matter of stamina. If you go into the average visual effects studio, if you go at, into the average production, the people running around doing the work um, are under 40. And there's a reason for that. You know, management, you know, when you start getting into sort of management, senior management, studio level, you know, that, that upper bubble line creatives on the, on the production side, they tend to be generally skewed towards older, not, not necessarily the talent, you know, actors and actresses and that sort of thing. Um, but really the, the bulk of the labor is done by younger people because they're the ones that can sustain it physiologically. Now, we both know, or we all know here, that if you put somebody in that environment and then leave them there for about 25 years, the first thing that happens is the body starts to break down. There's just no two ways about it. Because what happens when you're exposed to that kind of stress day in and day out, it's not something that takes place just in your mind. It's not just a brain thing. What happens is the brain triggers the release of all kinds of chemicals, you know, cortisol, adrenaline. Well, what are these? These are stress molecules. And in our natural sort of environment as human beings running across the steppes of Africa or Asia 10,000 years ago, those chemicals were designed to basically keep us away from predators, allow us to escape life-threatening situations. They're short-term, they're these bursts that you get so you can outrun the tiger or the, you know, run away or engage the army that's coming towards you with swords, <laughs> right? And then 
you go back down into a, a basal level. What happens in the entertainment industry is that people's cortisol and adrenaline levels go up and they stay there for hours. And it's what we call peak performance. And one of the things that these chemicals do is they affect the immune system, they affect the respiratory system, they affect the digestive system. How do they affect them? They basically shut them down, right? So maybe you both had the experience of working on shows and you're working, 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 and you've got you know, seven day weeks, you know, maybe a couple of all-nighters, whatever it takes, and you can feel that energy. And then the show ends, and then your system goes back down, and then surely enough, I mean, this, this happens on every single show I've ever been on, <laughs> get people sick. get sick, right? <laughs> yes. Well, that's because your immune system has been shut down, and you're basically running on cortisol and adrenaline. Now, it's kind of funny, that as we laugh about it, that, okay, everybody got the cold, you know, at the end of, you know, whatever movie. But when people get into their 40s and 50s, it's not the cold they're getting. It's the cancer. It's the heart disease. Right? We've known this for 60, 70 years. This is not new. And it's really kind of taking a square look at this saying, okay, is this thing that I'm doing, is it worth my life? Because it's really going to short take years off your life. you know. And that's if you survive it. Now, I've... Uh, heard about, I guess in the past 10 years, a number of people who were, you know, at my age range or younger, um, who have either died, I mean, and these very rare cancers, um, or have been so uh, compromised that they can't work anymore, you know, and, and ranges of illnesses that are things that are easily, easily treatable. But because the immune system has been so depleted, because the body has been so depleted, because the amount of stress, psychological and physical, uh, has been so intense that these people often don't survive very treatable cancers, very treatable heart disease, or whatever it may be. And so the dangers are very real. These aren't just kind of uh, psychological, you know, let's tough it out. We can do that in our 20s and 30s to some extent. By the time people get into their 40s, it's a very different ball game, and that's just the nature. Mm. There is nothing in this, uh, you know, that you can do to pre prevent the aging process. You know, your body's you going to age. Um, have you heard of a book called "The Body Says No"? Yes, and yes, it's very good. Ga uh, Ga uh, Gaber, Gaber Martor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, um. I, I, you know, I, uh, because my wife is studying this kind of stuff right now, yeah. she's really interested and, and, and I was listening to it and looking at it and I find it fascinating. Um, and I, I would suggest anybody to research that more because it's, uh, in, in our community, uh, although, you know, I mean, there's a lot of VFX, uh, people listening, but. There's also a lot of you know concept artists who are in pre-production. There's all kinds of people listening. Um, it's hyper competitive, so you're always constantly go go go. Um, the hours themselves may not be crazy, but the free the nature of a freelance lifestyle means you're overlapping jobs, and so mm -hmm. you you've just gone from one job to two jobs a day, and you're working 14 hours. Now that's crazy. Um, mm -hmm. I've been guilty to it. Um, uh, but, um, so, you know, I would suggest anybody to, that is really interesting. And, and I, you know, it does take a toll is, is, is the bottom line. Um, I, I had a question on, you know, say you see a friend, um, having issues, uh, or just, you know, something's off. Uh, cause I personally, uh, I've known people in the past, um, and I don't, a lot of times I took it personally as they didn't want to talk to me or they didn't want to interface with me because they needed some space. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I didn't know how to deal with somebody who has maybe depression, uh, some, some sever some form of it, or, you know, I, d I don't know. Um, and, and I guess I, I'm just like, I'm pretty open about how I am as a person. So, you know, I, I, I tend to want to interface with people and say, Hey, are you okay? Are you okay? 
and a lot of times I get back is just just leave me alone <laughs> mm -hmm. and and I end up taking it personally and then you kind of you know but I, I'll still come back but I know some people who just take it personally and just they just leave and that's the like the end of the friendship sometimes mm -hmm. um, and I feel like is there if you see somebody in that situation as a friend I mean it, are there any words of advice you would have um, for those people well I mean it... If somebody doesn't want contact, if somebody is going to sort of, uh, you know, avoid talking about what's bothering them, there's really not a whole lot you as a friend or, uh, you know, even a partner, uh, you know, or a colleague can do if a person's not ready to talk. You know, this is the same thing as going to therapy. If somebody doesn't want to go, they're not going to go. Mm. And... What we'd often discover, I mean, I can tell you as a therapist, what often happens, what I've seen anyway, is that people's, the level of personal suffering gets so great that it usually starts to impact, first of all, their relationships, then their work, or the other way around, and it can't be ignored anymore. And sometimes people have to suffer quite a bit before they're, they're ready to change. Um, the suffering always wins. That, that's that's the thing to think somebody can kind of grit and get get through it. Um, it it's an it's a beautiful illusion, I think. And it's but it's also to me, it's it's very young illusion. I mean, that's that's maybe what I would have believed in when I was 21. Um, you know, at 50. No. I mean, it, it, it's biology and psychology always win. They always win. And so yeah. sometimes we just have to let people kind of, especially if they don't want to talk about it. And it's like, okay, I'm here if you need me. Yeah, because I, I remember um, I was talking to a friend who had depression or some form of it. And, and I was talking about another friend. And he was like, you know, uh, just keep reaching out. Um, maybe they don't want to talk, but just keep reaching out. Because you never know one of those times they might be ready to talk. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I already reached out like three times, ah, you know, like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I got a little bit like that because I was hurt, you know, I was like, ah, oh, come on, you know, I've, but in the end, you have to try to think if you were in their position and, and it's hard because you can't be empathetic to something you know nothing about. Um, right. And right. so that's why when I'm asking you these questions that, you know, I'm sure, you know, there may be that one person that you might be a little upset at. And that is not receiving that, um, you know, you're, you're wanting to talk, but it's not personal. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's purely because at that moment they just not capable mm -hmm. and to keep reaching out, um, to me seemed like it's a good way to go, but I don't know. Um, you know, it depends very much on the friendship. It depends on the nature of the relationship. So there's a lot of context that's involved. There's not a one answer, you know, for all occasions. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is going to depend on the nature of the friendship. I always tell people that, you know, when I it just personally, my personal life, hey, my door's always open and I'll ping them, you know, call them maybe. Um, but if they're not ready to talk, they're not ready to talk. You know, Fair. that 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 they know that you're available is, I think, really important. That's really important. But there are just times when people aren't, aren't ready yet. Is, is there any other is there any time where it's like uh, there are danger signs that you OK, I need to, you know, I mean, uh, I, I would assume it's like sort of, you know, something that goes against their nature, you know, things that you see that are ex in an extreme kind of way. Um, mm -hmm. and you kind of have to step in and say, Hey, look, you, you're going to harm yourself. Mm -hmm. I got to do something about this. Um, I guess, you know, for me, I, I just don't know what that would even look like. <laughs> um, but I, well, I can tell you one thing that comes to mind right away. And this is also a big problem in the entertainment industry in particular is, um, by and large, the entertainment industry, you also see this a lot. I've seen this a lot in the music industry, in the fashion, finance, law, is the amount of substance and alcohol abuse uh, that people use as a coping mechanism is through the roof. It's disproportionate in oh, relative God, to the general population. Yeah, mm. It's huge. 
it's huge. I can tell you just, you know, not, not from patients that I've worked with now, but, you know, going back to my previous career, uh, we sent an awful lot of people to rehab at different place, places, different facilities. Um, I saw an immense amount of substance and alcohol abuse. Um, it was, it was pretty endemic. And there's one thing to have that, you know, again, as a younger man and everybody's running around experimenting and, you know, some facilities are kind of uh, legendary for having their heyday for that. But there's, you know, there's a number of people that don't uh, don't don't escape from that. You know, there's mm -hmm. probably people that, you know, that have fairly serious that you both know have fairly serious addiction problems but you're probably not aware of it because right now they can probably keep it hidden it doesn't mean that it's not affecting them it just means it's hidden from you mm. you know i i knew of one case uh again this isn't a patient this is just in you know my previous career where um a number of people that i knew would um pour vodka into their little uh, go cups uh, or um, sort of bottles, water bottles, and just kind of sip it throughout the day. You know, different artists would sit there and just, you know, there's vodka and some lemon juice or whatever. And, and I didn't know this was going on until I did. And as a producer, then it became sort of, oh, well, this, this, this might not be a good thing. Yeah, that's and, definitely uh, <laughs> sound like a very good thing, um, and I didn't even realize. But even you know, back then when we had the lunch and people were drinking, you know, it's not just the one drink; it's four or five, and they're going back after lunch, pretty much hammered. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, you just think, yeah, young, you know, we just you know like that. But yeah, I mean. And and I guess that's when it starts coming out. And when you see something like that in a in a friend of yours, you may really want to question that and, well, see what you can do to help. I guess, um, because in in these cases, I mean, there's not. You can only do what you can do and what you notice. Uh, I guess, um, mm. but yeah, that's definitely a great one to, to look at. Um, do you want to? You maybe... want to ask real quick about yeah. the the forty year old thing. The, 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 our, our, uh, I was going to go to wrap up topic. I was going to go first uh, before we get to the wrap up. I think um, maybe talk a little bit about a different kind of addiction. I mean, we it, it's it, and it's about oh. social media, right? And oh. because it's it's a <laughs> yes. tricky it's a tricky subject, right? I mean, you talk about like um, the, the the nature of relate the, the nature of friendships and and uh, which determine if if somebody might open up to you or not. And I mean, I certainly have and had great friendships um, in, in, in t uh, I, and unless you nurture them, they, they, they just slowly kind of fall off. Um, and, and for me, it was after, after I uh, moved out of, moved away from Germany and, and now I live in Singapore. Um, and of course, naturally, the, the, the good friendships I had since high school kind of slowly fade away. And, and at some point, you just have to let them go. But going back to social media, I mean, for a lot of artists, it's a lifeline because that's how we get jobs. Um, and, and not only are we using it for our own personal, sharing our own personal lives, we also share um, and, and, and uh, make a living out of sharing our professional lives, which just adds to all the confusion, I think. And the, the kind of, I mean, I know the kind of um, friendships that I built um, online, if you can even call them friendships, right? I mean, the one with E-Man is a bit different, but I mean, most most artists I talk to because I, I don't really have any local artists friend, the most artists I talk to, it's a, it's a very... Um, it's a very casual, uh, superficial, sometimes opportunistic kind of way of looking at, at, a, at a human relationship, right? Because, I mean, oh, hey, I, I have a job for you. Or, hey, do you have a job for me? Or, hey, your art is cool. And it doesn't really go much deeper than that. And, of course, like, you're not, you're not going to trust that person that you know, like, randomly from the Internet with, with your deepest thoughts. And you don't expect them to be aware of what you're going through, right? So, I mean, how, how, can, how can artists um, deal uh, more effectively or how can, like... Is, Everybody has seen, I think, the social dilemma on Netflix. I hope, um, and get an idea of how how bad things can go. And um, 
is, is there any sort of recommendation you have on like um like stay away from that or it, it's it's set maybe maybe set yourself some rules to to use so how to use social media i don't know um it, it seems to be quite i mean life defining for a lot of people what happens online mm, well it is and there is such a thing as you know you could call it social media addiction mm. uh addiction's a tricky word mm. in, in my field because they want to tie it to uh you know a very scientific Uh, criteria of are there brain changes is this, and uh, some substance an exogenous substance being introduced mm. in the nervous system that has a cascading effect you know there's mm. a whole kind of very specific uh, way that we use it but you know you might call it a compulsion like people that check social media every hour or every minute every five minutes um, what I'll you know I've thought a lot about this over the last um, 10 years really. I, I did my, my dissertation was on the impact of media on human psychology and development across the lifespan. And one thing, especially for artists, is that you're right, social media is a way to promote yourself. It is a way to network. Um, the question becomes is are those acquaintanceships or are those friendships? Are those collegial relationships and professional relationships? In other words, is there a transaction taking place? I give you this, you give me that. I give you likes, you give me attention, right? That's a transaction. Um, or are they actual friendships? And every person is going to have to ask themselves that question. You know, I think that uh, for me, becoming aware that I tend to use social media as a way not to showcase me, but I, I use it personally as a way to showcase ideas, to talk about discussion. Like, you know, anybody who's seen some of my postings will say, you know, there's philosophy on there, here's a bit of psychology, here's a bit of news, here's a bit of politics, um, because that, I think, is how I'd like to use it. There's other people that use it as uh, personal brand management. And what's the brand? Well, the brand is me. And not just me as a professional, but me as a person. And look at my car and look at my house and look at my partner and look at my dog and look at all the things that I have and the shiny life. And and it's very manufactured. Um, for an artist, I think like most of, uh, I'll use Emmanuel, I'll use your art, for example. I mean, this, the astonishing art that I've seen on, on your social media, um, because I, I know what a good artist you are. I've worked with you. But every time I see one of your uh concept paintings i mean i'm just blown away but that's how i know the caliber of what you produce you know if i in, in other words if i had never worked with you and and seen what you can produce i would look at that and go my god let's get him you know because it it functions for that that i i would argue as a very effective uh personal brand kind of advertising for you and if people can maybe Uh, I'm not suggesting everybody's going to do this, but to know that that social media, I mean, the old saying is you are the product. The media companies are basically trafficking in the currency of attention. So everything that you do on there is making money for somebody and it's not you necessarily. Right. And as the product, well, you have to decide, are these relationships, in fact, what you'd call deep, nurturing, generative? Do they bring me something the way a friendship would? Or are they just bringing me work, which is valuable? Work is valuable, especially for anybody that's freelance, right? You so need that. The counterpoint is, when does it become something that's, okay, We, you know, there is the, you know, You got to do it for work and get your exposure and 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 de define the relationships. But when does it become dangerous? You know, in terms of a mental health standpoint, because that you you could be on there all the time, and as soon as you don't get what you want, you're down in the pits. Mm -hmm. You know, is when does it become like okay? You got to really watch out. Um, are there any warning? I, I would say when one can look around. It take a kind of, you know, like what they would say in AA, take an on, honest inventory and say, wow, is the majority of my social interaction taking place through a mediated format? Is it taking place online? 
is the majority of my self-esteem coming from reacts and emoticons and thumbs and likes and happy, you know, whatever it is, is it actually taking place online or are there people in my life that give me that? Am I more isolated? Do I actually have human contact? Meaning, can I call a friend on the phone? Are there people that I can, I mean, these days everybody's trapped at home. I mean, lots of people are using like online gaming with their friends as a way to do things that are social. I mean, plenty of people have cocktail hours with their friends or dinners with their friends virtual. That's a little bit different than social media, which is 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 sort of, am I checking Facebook, Instagram, Twitter every five minutes to make sure that somebody responded to my post. Is this, in fact, where my self-esteem is being derived? And that's an honest question that has to be answered honestly. Because if the answer is yes, for me, as, as, a, as a clinician, as a psychologist, as an analyst in training, I'd say something in your life is an imbalance. Mm. Even for people that are intro introverted. Introverted doesn't mean living in solitude, by the way. Introverted just means you get your energy from smaller groups, maybe one-on-one -on -one interactions, or from participating in an activity that's meaningful to you, right? Extroverted means I get energized when I'm around other people. That really feeds my soul. Mm, that's a great way of explaining that. And I think my wife will love that <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, we've, you know, been talking about the introvert versus extrovert things. I mean, there's so much, honestly, that we can talk about. And, um, you know, if you're up for it, would love to sort of maybe target even more specific things in a, you know, future episode. Because, I mean, sure. I, I, I know that, you know, on uh, some of the things I've heard, you know, the, the, the age, um, you know, the midlife uh, issues you've dealt a lot with and, and, and a lot of it is because you've talked to people at the end of their lives who have a lot of regrets. Um, and I think that's also why you've changed careers so that you could actually do something that mattered. Um, and and, and I, I think that's something that maybe in the future we could really discuss. Um, sure. You know, because I sure. think that's a big one, right? What do you think, Jan? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very interested, I think, in... Uh... In that part, because again, we're all not the youngest anymore, and um, th there's always that feeling. And I think it was it was one of the lines you mentioned in in the interview that uh, we've seen previously is that um, that feeling of like, okay, you're at a certain point, um, you have invested a certain amount of time and 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 money in a, in a career, and uh, I think it's like the the golden handcuffs you 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 called it of like oh you make a certain amount of money it's, it's really good and uh, if you just keep on doing that uh, until you uh, retire then everything's going to be fine but then deep down you're always asking yourself like okay is this is this it is this what I'm going to do and then um, after that I'm going to go gardening um, or can can <laughs> I do something else right is is there is there something mm. more to this than then uh, I don't know, whatever, right? VFX, concept art, whatever. Um, and, and I think that's a very interesting discussion to have from, from my point, at least. Well, you yeah, know, I'll I leave think, you... Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I just want to leave you both with, with this kind of question for you and your listeners and viewers to kind of think about. And this is something I've learned from people who are musicians, professional musicians, composers, and I was astonished to discover that a lot of them don't do music as a hobby anymore. So how much of your art do you do as a hobby now? Oh, is that a question? Mm -hmm. It's just <laughs> oh, something uh, yeah. to kind of marinate with. Like yeah. mm -hmm. some artists don't do any art when the, I'm commercial artists, I'm talking about when they're not involved in a project. Now that's kind of a tipping point, and that's an interesting thing to consider. And, and again, it's one of those honest assessments of: Do I do this just for the love of it for myself anymore, or do I tend to do this more when I'm involved in a project? And different people have different answers. Um, I would argue, and this is just what I've seen, um, you know, in working with people, that when that tipping point goes towards kind of career burnout, it, 
a lot of people don't do it as a hobby anymore. They don't do it out of just love. They don't do it in their free time. And that's a very interesting thing. Something to think about. <laughs> a good question. Definitely. Should... I mean, and I'm looking at you, Jan. There's yeah, yeah, definitely... yeah. Yeah, I'm guilty of I that. I think we're completely different. <laughs> we're completely different on two different spectrum, right? Jan? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely, yeah. It's an interesting thing to yeah, think I mean, about. I, I, I'll <laughs> just say that I, I'm the one that's, um, that can't wait to, to, to paint and do my next thing. Exactly. And, I, and I think Jan's. Um, yeah, I, I have. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's, let's leave it at that. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't done much personal stuff in a long time. Yeah. Maybe it's time for that. Um, anyways, uh, I think this is a, is a good place to, uh, for, for us to wrap up this episode. And I think all the listeners to have a moment and think about what they, what they just heard. I think there was plenty in there. Um, for for people to consider um and um yeah i think if we want to drill down into some of these subjects in future episodes uh, then please uh, for all the listeners please do let us know if there's something in particular you want to um, hear about something that concerns you something that uh, you've noticed maybe in yourself or your friends um so please let us know in the comments. We're always happy to, to have a discussion. We're going to leave you with uh, some of the uh, links to the books and, and films we mentioned in this episode in the comments below. And we're also going to link to, to your profile, Jody, um, so people can, can reach out to you uh, if they have any questions um, pertaining yeah. to this. And um, is there anything else you wanted to say in the end, Iman, Jody, anything to wrap up? Or? No, I'm good. Jody, anything? Uh, but thanks I, it, a lot it, it, for coming on. Course. I think, you know, this is one of those things where uh, people are going to gain a lot from this. And even if it's just that one person who listens at the right time, it's worth the effort. Um, and and I appreciate that. And and yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank for you for coming on. You're welcome. Okay, You're welcome. I, I I always have had a, a soft spot for all my former colleagues in the <laughs> trenches um especially those that want to get out of the trenches that's it's a it, it, it can be done it's not easy but anything to me worth doing is not easy um but it can be done that's a good so. good thing good good final uh line to end this podcast with so Thank you so much for, for listening, everybody. And uh, thank you so much, of course, for, for coming on uh, with us here, Jody. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, please like, comment and subscribe. And again, let us know if you have any further questions rega regarding this topic. And we'll try to get to this in a future episode. Okay. Have a good one and uh, see you guys next week. Bye.